you get to invite them and, and have them come be with you. Because really why we do it? No, no. <laughs> Let's face it, it's part of it. <laughs> and one of those people for me has been uh, Colin Wilson. Before I introduce him, I'd like to read a, a couple of short quotes from his book called The Mind Parasites. It was published in 1967, and when I was doing my hippie thing, when I was? Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's a book that I enjoyed a lot. And just some of the quotes, this will give you an idea of who, uh, who he is, for those of you who might not know. Quote, The thing that astounded me most was the tremendous strength of human beings to have succeeded in living in spite of the terrible veil of insanity that hides them from reality. They must be one of the hardiest species in the universe. Another one. I have said that man draws his power from a secret life source in the depths of his being. This source is man's inviolable center of gravity, his real being. It is completely indestructible. One more, a couple more. We are talking about some immense primeval source of energy, what Bernard Shaw called the life force. It is the raw vitality that drives us all. We have far less willpower than we believe. This means that we have almost no real freedom. To be godlike means to be in control of things instead of being a victim of circumstance. But it must be emphasized that there can be no ultimate control. Well, there are great unanswered questions. Colin Wilson burst upon the literary scene with his bestseller, The Outsider, when he was only 25. He is an enormous, enormously prolific writer with some 80 major works to his credit, works which deal with a wide variety of subjects existential philosophy, religion, occult and supernatural phenomena, music, sex, archaeology, astronomy, and cosmology. His most recent book is <clears throat> The Atlantis Blueprint, Unlocking the Ancient Mysteries of a Long Lost Civilization, which he wrote along with Rand Flemeton. <clears throat> He's going to be talking to us about that today. But according to a recent email I received from a, a Key West resident, um, this is a most appropriate topic to be discussed here in that many, if not most, of the people in the Keys are former residents of Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> There's some of them here now, yeah? <laughs> So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Colin Wilson. This uh, story started for me in 1979 when I received a book for review by a man called John Anthony West, which was called Serpent in the Sky. Serpent in the Sky was mainly about a strange maverick Egyptologist called Shwala de Lubix. And Shwala de Lubix had spent some 10 years of his life studying the temple at Luxor and discovered some extremely interesting things about it. It's an incredibly difficult book to read, and uh, I plodded through it with some difficulty until I got to the last chapter, 
Then in the last chapter, I really suddenly came wide awake because it was called Egypt, the heir to Atlantis. And what he said in this chapter was that when Schwaller had looked at the Sphinx, he had said, that has not been weathered by windblown sand. That has been weathered by water. Now, as you know, there's not been any great quantity of rain in Egypt for thousands of years. What Shwala went on to say was that there was an ancient tradition that the continent called Atlantis disappeared around about 9600 BC and that the people in Atlantis realized what was happening for quite some time before and their priests moved to many places among them Egypt and that the Sphinx in fact had been built by the people who moved to Egypt in around about 9600 BC now this absolutely fascinated me and so whenever I had to write about Atlantis subsequently I would always quote John Anthony West's book and this notion that in fact the Sphinx was built by priests who came from Atlantis. Um, Gurdjieff incidentally says the same in his All and Everything, Beelzebub's Tales. And for a long, long time, I didn't really think any more about this. I didn't know John Anthony West. And then I got an offer from um, film producer called Dino De Laurentiis who wanted me to write a script about Atlantis for him and so the first thing I decided to do was to write the script around this idea that in fact um, Atlantis had disappeared in 9600 BC and that ancient Egypt was in a sense the heir to Atlantis so I settled down to doing the outline of this um, script and I once again began to study this matter of whether it was possible that in fact Egypt is some kind of heir to Atlantis. Now, what John West had said in Serpent in the Sky was this. Civilizations take a long time to develop. And when you look at the tremendous level of learning in ancient Egypt, um, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, science, then you realize that this did not happen overnight. And yet, according to the scholars, Egypt came into existence around about 3000 BC. And then, of course, the um, Great Pyramid was built around about, we think, 500 years later, around about 2500 BC. And this um, is, in the general view, is also the time when the Sphinx was also built. Now, about this time, I received out of the blue a letter from John West. Total coincidence, I, d I didn't know him. We'd never been in correspondence. And what John said in his letter was that he had finally persuaded an archaeologist from Boston University to go with him to Egypt to have a look at the Sphinx. He got hold of a man called Robert Schock. And when he talked to Shock about this idea of his, <clears throat> Shock's first reaction had been uh, rather nervous. He'd said, well, look, wait until next year when I've got tenure, and <clears throat> then maybe I could come with you. So John waited a year, and at the end of this year, Shock got his tenure and said, okay, ready to go. And uh, off they went to Egypt, and John said that when they got there, um, to the Sphinx enclosure, he kept thinking, you know, have I made some utterly stupid mistake? Is he going to say to me, oh, don't be silly, look, this and so on. Anyway, this did not happen. Shock looked at the Sphinx and looked carefully at the Sphinx enclosure. Um, as you know, the Sphinx was originally sort of walled in on three sides. Now one of the walls has more or less disappeared, so you have uh, two sides. And um, <clears throat> Shock looked carefully at the Sphinx enclosure 
And he said, well, you know, I don't understand this. I don't understand why no one has ever spotted this before, but yeah, you're right. This is water weathering. Now, there's a difference, and it's a fairly obvious difference, between water weathering um, and weathering by wind blown sand. When um, a rock which has various densities is attacked by wind blown sand blowing against it like a sandblaster, um, the soft parts of the rock are obviously um, eaten away and the hard parts remain sticking out. So when you look at the rock in profile, it looks like that, you see, a kind of sandwich. Now, with water weathering, um, it is vaguely the same because the water comes down from the sky, runs down the rock and wears away the soft bits and leaves the hard bits sticking out. But there's one major difference. Since the water is running downwards, it's also slicing downwards through the rock. So that in point of fact, when you look at the profile of rock that's been water weathered, it sort of looks a bit like a series of baby's bottoms. You know, it sort of goes in and out. And uh, Shock saw this. And he said, yep, um, Shuala de Lubix was right. This is quite definitely weathering by rain. So anyway, this finding was presented in 1991 at a geologist conference in California. And oddly enough, the geologists were quite sympathetic to this view because what Schock went on to say was his guess was that maybe the Sphinx was approximately twice as old as anybody had thought. As I say, we take it for granted that the Sphinx uh, was made at about the same time as the Great Pyramid, about 2500 BC. And um, what he was saying was that in point of fact, his guess was that maybe the Sphinx was built in around about 7000 BC or sometime around then. Well, this caused tremendous attacks from the scholars. And um, I happened to see this when I was um, traveling uh, to um, Japan and somebody dug out a piece from the Mainichi Daily News that had this item about the Sphinx and uh, Shock's suggestion that in fact the Sphinx was 7,000 years old and the fury of various scholars who said this is total nonsense. Anyway, when I received this stuff from John Anthony West, I was deeply interested because what John had done was to send me an article published in some um, glossy magazine he had decided to get a forensic expert to go with him and look at the Sphinx. Now, if you ever looked at the Sphinx closely, you'll see that the head looks rather too small for the body. Sort of tiny pinhead on this enormous body. And uh, it looks as if the head has been carved more than once. Well, the head of the Sphinx is supposed to be um, the head of the pharaoh Cheops, who built the Great Pyramid. Now, we have, in fact, one um, single portrait of Cheops, which was found in the Sphinx Temple. And what the forensic expert did was to look carefully at the picture of Cheops and then at the head of the Sphinx, which, of course, is partly worn away. And he shook his head and said, no, that's definitely not Cheops. He said, to begin with, if you look at it closely, you'll see that the head of the Sphinx is actually a black, is a Nubian. You see this, the cheeks, and he drew um, lines showing that the angle of the cheekbones is completely different in the Pharaoh and um, in the Sphinx. So, you know, this was, uh, this was a very interesting step because the scholars had taken it absolutely for granted that the Sphinx was, in fact, a portrait of the pharaoh Cheops, you know, also known as Khufu, and who ruled round about 2500 BC. So, um, I was fascinated by all this stuff. And uh, the reason I was fascinated was that I'd always believed that, in point of fact, civilization is a great deal older than we think it is. As you know, Civilization is supposed to be, um, let's say, 10,000 years old. The 
earliest cities in Mesopotamia were built maybe 8,000 BC. And even that is a fairly recent um, estimate because up to uh, only about 10, 15 years ago, the general feeling was that 6,000 BC was around about their age. Now, the next step in this for me was a rather interesting one. I met this man, Rand Flemath, with whom I wrote the book, The Atlantis Blueprint. And Rand told me a fascinating story. He had got to know an American academic called Charles Hapgood. And Hapgood had written a book called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, which made him quite famous, or would have made him quite famous. The only trouble with it was that just about the time when the book came out with this extremely interesting theory that people had been sailing around the Earth as long ago as 7,000 BC, when there wasn't supposed to be anything. Uh, at about um, this same time, it had been generally recognized that civilization, in fact, must have existed much longer ago than that because Hapgood had found a number of ancient maps. I've seen these maps myself. If you go along to the Library of Congress, they'll dig them out for you. What Hapgood did was to go along to the Library of Congress and say, um, can I see some of these ancient maps which are called portolands? They were used by medieval seafarers, and a portoland means from port to port. And so they spread out a great room full of these maps for Hapgood to look at. And Hapgood was fascinated by the fact that they were, to begin with, far more accurate than any of the normal maps that were then being printed at the time. I mean, one of these maps, for example, shows England shaped like a teapot. And uh, it was quite obvious that the medieval mariners knew a great, great deal more. Now, the more Hapgood studied these ancient maps, the more he became convinced that they must be based upon much, much older maps. Maps that dated back before the time of Alexander the Great, around about 300 BC. This was the thesis of his book, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. And unfortunately, just after it was published, which was 1966, a man called Eric von Däniken came out with a book called Chariots of the Gods, in which he talked all sorts of stuff about spacemen landing on Earth and uh, bringing a civilization and building ancient Egypt and building the statues of Easter Island, you know, heaven knows what other stuff. And also quoted approvingly Hapgood in this. And of course, this absolutely screwed Hapgood as far as the academic establishment was concerned. He was tarred with the same brush as von Däniken. Now, Hapgood, in fact, had had a very interesting career before that. What had happened was that Hapgood had um, been during the war in uh, something in America called the St Strategic Studies Office, which was the predecessor of the CIA. This was because before the war, um, he had studied German, had been in Berlin for quite a number of years, and they'd got him in as a, an expert on the Germans. Now, when um, the war came to an end, Hapgood got himself an academic job, and one of his students, a man called Henry Warrington, came up to him and said, <clears throat> is there any truth in this stuff about the lost continent of Mu, which is a continent that is supposed to have gone down in the Pacific Ocean, and maybe the same time that Atlantis is supposed to have gone down in the Atlantic Ocean, so Hapgood said, well, go and study it. And then, you know, bring me back an estimate of what you think. And he said, and by the way, you may as well study Atlantis as well. Now, Hapgood was completely convinced that all of this would prove to be total nonsense. And so when Warrington came back with a lot of evidence about Mu, which really did not properly add up. That is what Hapgood expected. But when Warrington then produced the stuff he'd got on Atlantis, Hapgood was oddly impressed. Um, this was quite different. What Warrington told Hapgood was that Plato, 
had described Atlantis in two of his dialogues, the Timaeus and the Critias, and he went on, he'd intended to go on and do a third dialogue. And he describes this continent, uh, which was uh, an extremely complex civilization, which according to Plato, had existed approximately 9,000 years earlier than his ancestor Solon. This made it round about 9,600 BC. Now, of course, we all know that there was no civilization in 9,600 BC, so Plato's story must be nonsense. But, in fact, Plato's story is so incredibly detailed and precise that either he was writing it as a kind of novel, or he really knew something about this. Now, Plato claims that he got the story of Atlantis from the priests of ancient Egypt and that they told him that this continent had disappeared in a day and a night in some great catastrophe. Now, Hapgood read all this stuff and was quite impressed because Plato really does, when you read him, make th this impression that he's talking about something he really knows about, that he's got some information about. But then we don't know where Plato got this detailed information. Um, he went on to write more about Atlantis in a second dialogue called the Critias. And in the second dialogue, he suddenly breaks off quite abruptly. And this was almost certainly because he died at the age of 80 at about this time. So we don't know where Plato got the story of Atlantis. At least we don't know where he got all the detailed story of Atlantis that you'll find. You should read the Timaeus, by the way, if you haven't read it. It really reads like a science fiction novel. So, anyway, Hapgood was so interested in this stuff, he began to think, a continent disappears in a day and a night. What could make a whole continent disappear in that kind of time? And the first thing he thought of was, you know, some, something from outer space crashing on Earth. That um, didn't seem a, a very good theory. The other theory was, did something go wrong with the Earth itself? And now he had an interesting experience. He was washing a rug, which he'd put in the kitchen washing machine. And when he put it on spin, the rug bunched up with the result that he went, woof, woof, woof and tore the bolts out of the floor. And Hapgood suddenly thought, now I wonder if the Earth spinning around the sun like a washing machine um, could have had part of its weight displaced, you know, the crust displaced. Could that in fact have caused this problem? A friend of his called Campbell looked into the actual mechanics of this, he was a mathematician, and um, Another man called Brown actually produced a thing which he called the Hab Theory, which was that the Earth has periodically um, turned over onto its side because of this spin effect. Habgood got more and more impressed with this notion because, you see, the Earth's crust is only about 40 miles thick at its thickest, and it floats upon a sea of sort of molten rock called magma. And so in theory, the crust could kind of slip around in this same way, you know. Imagine the skin of an orange being so extremely loose that you can imagine that if the orange falls on the floor, then the skin is going to move. Hatwood thought that this was a possibility. And as soon as he began to look into this more closely, he began to see that in fact there's a good deal of evidence that this could be true. Um, when rock harden, the molecules in the rocks are left, so to speak, um, pointing the same way that they had been when the rock was molten. And this applies also to iron ore. Now, all of the molecules in big fields of iron ore are pointing not towards our present North Pole, as you would expect. They're pointing, in fact, to Hudson Bay some 2,000 miles further south. And when Hapgood really went into this to find out when exactly this was, he discovered that in fact, it was round about 
9,500 or 600 BC. The pole, the North Pole, had been in Hudson Bay in 9,600 BC, and he was able to tell this because of the iron molecules pointing in this direction. Now, um, it's, it is, of course, quite false to talk about the pole itself moving. What actually moves, of course, is the skin of the Earth over the pole. And so you could imagine, imagine a schoolboy wearing a sort of cap like this, and you take hold of the cap and pull it up further. This is roughly what Hapgood said had happened to the Earth. Now, he wrote a letter to Albert Einstein talking about this theory of his, and to his great delight, after a mere ten days, Einstein replied, I think you've got something that's seriously interesting here. Why don't you go ahead and develop it? And so, with Einstein's approval, Hapgood went on, studied a great deal more of this geology, and finally came up with an extremely interesting book called Earth's Shifting Crust. Now, by this time, Einstein had died, but nevertheless, Einstein had written a preface to the book, which meant that he was taken seriously, he got an audience. Of course, all of the orthodox geologists said that this was total nonsense, and none of them liked the fact that Hapgood was a professor of history and not a geologist, but anyway. At least the book got an audience. Now, not very long after that, Hapgood happened to be listening to a broadcast from Georgetown in Washington. A number of people were sitting around a table discussing these ancient maps that had been found, and in particular, a map by a man called Piri Rice, which means actually Admiral Rice, a Turkish admiral who lived some 50 years before the time of Shakespeare and who had been executed. But Piri Rice had, in fact, um, created an extremely complex sort of map which showed the whole of the coast of South America, it also showed Africa over the sea. It also showed at the bottom a little bit of the South Pole. Now, the South Pole was not discovered until the 19th century. And yet there on this map, dating 50 years before Shakespeare, you have the South Pole shown quite clearly, part of it called Queen Maud's Land. What intrigued these people was that it was such an extraordinary, accurate picture of the South Pole. But what was even more intriguing was the fact that the South Pole was shown without ice. Now, we know that, in fact, the South Pole has been covered in ice for something like um, at least 5,000 BC. And yet, here was this map which appeared to show a great bay in Queen's, Queen's Maudland, which is now covered under something like two miles of ice, and showed it as a proper bay. Now, it so happened that in a World Geographical Survey, they'd studied the coast um, of, uh, of Antarctica, and had in fact realized that this is so. There really is a bay there underneath two miles of ice. So somebody had been able to make a map of the South Pole before there was any ice on it. Anyway, Hapgood, as I say, was fascinated by all this stuff and uh, got hold of the Piriorize map. And then he wrote to the Library of Congress and said, can I bring my students along and see if you've got any more of these maps? So they said, oh yeah, sure, come along. He went along and discovered that, in fact, a whole room full of maps had been laid out for him, dozens of them. And some of these maps were absolutely hair-raising. Before Antarctica was covered in ice, it's actually two big continents sliced right down the middle. One of these maps showed it sliced right down the middle. The maps also showed Antarctica as, as it was when there were mountains under the two miles of ice, when there were rivers. In fact, one of the maps showed it in such detail that you had to believe that some mariner had deliberately gone inland and had actually looked at Antarctica and had then made a map of it. Now, why would a mariner go inland in a continent as big as Antarctica? 
who, in fact, would bother to make a map of Antarctica unless the inhabitants of Antarctica. So it began to look more and more as if there had been a time when Antarctica was, in fact, an inhabited continent. Now, this fitted in very precisely with Hapgood's thoughts about Earth's shifting crust because if the Hudson Bay Pole had in fact slipped 2,000 miles, then Antarctica had also once upon a time been around about 2,000 miles further north and had therefore been a much warmer place than it is nowadays. So <clears throat> it began to look more and more as if it was onto something quite interesting and important. Now, Rand Flamath had got so fascinated by this question of Atlantis that he moved with his wife to London so that he could study it in the British Museum. And in the British Museum, he discovered all kinds of interesting evidence, geological evidence, that did seem to show that Atlantis had, as Rand put it in his first um, paper on all this, Atlantis had been Antarctica the South Pole. You see, Plato describes it as being a great continent beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar. So, Rand wrote to Hapgood, he'd been in contact with Hapgood before he left, and said, look, I've discovered all this fascinating new stuff about Antarctica. And Hapgood wrote back saying, marvelous, that it really is wonderful, you really have done such wonderful and precise work proving my point. He said that I have recently come across some extremely interesting evidence which I'm going to put in the new edition of Earth Shifting Crust, which was, he was calling the path of the pole, which appears to show that civilization could date back a hundred thousand years. Well, Hapgood was a professor of history. Rand was completely shaken by this. And what's more, Hapgood said, a civilization with a fairly high degree of scientific sophistication. So Rand wrote back saying, quick, tell me, tell me. His letter was returned two months later, stamped deceased. Hapgood had walked in front of a car and been killed. Now, this was the story that Rand told me. Hapgood had died um, at the end of 1981. What we wanted to know was what did Hapgood mean about civilization being 100,000 years old? Was it just some strange idea of a dusty old man because by that time he was about 80? Or in fact, had he really found some evidence? And if so, what was this evidence? Now, Rand had already discovered one rather interesting thing. Uh, in South America, there are a large number of um, sacred sites. And most of these sacred sites are, as you might expect, aligned more or less north. But there's rather an odd thing about the sacred sites. Nearly all of them are aligned 15 degrees off proper north. And when Rand examined this on a globe, he discovered that, of course, what the sacred sites were pointing at was the Hudson Bay. So it began to look as if these sacred sites had been built pointing towards the Hudson Bay Pole. And since we know the Hudson Bay Pole disappeared around about 9,600 BC, then we also have an indication that there was civilization around 9,600 BC. This, you know, may well have been what we call Atlantis. Anyway, we set out to try and track down just what Hapgood meant by this stuff about civilization being 100,000 years old. I mean, you know, that's preposterous. Um, only 20 years ago, it was taken for granted that our ancestor, Cro-Magnon Man, didn't appear on Earth until about 40,000 years ago. Before that, of course, there was Neanderthal Man, 
And so, what was apparently being argued was that civilization had existed in the Hudson Bay region around about 10,000 BC, because obviously Atlantis must have been a civilization before it disappeared, a fairly complex civilization. So, we began to ask around among all Hapgood's friends. We got onto his cousin, Beth. We got onto his sons. We got onto everybody Hapgood had ever known and said, do you have any idea what Hapgood meant by this thing about civilization being 100,000 years old? And again and again and again, we drew absolutely no result. So it began to look eventually as if um, the whole thing was, um, was going to fall through. Which was a great pity, because by this time we'd sold the idea to a publisher for a fairly large advance. <laughs> anyway, then one day somebody said to me, why don't you um, try this um, man who lives in Dover, New Hampshire? <clears throat> I'm going to call him Carl Hergesheimer. That's not his name, but you'll see why I call him that in a minute. So, um, can I take this coat off, by the way? I mean, will my microphone fall out? No. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, thanks. So I um, got the telephone number of this Carl Hergesheimer, and I rang him and I said, look, you know, we're looking for evidence about Hapgood and Hapgood's idea that civilization could have been 100,000 years old. Um, any idea where Hapgood might have got it from? And he said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, I told him. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, you know. And I said, well, look, what do you mean? Uh, why? Why did you tell him that? What, what kind of evidence do you have? So he said, well, um, part of it um, is geodetic. That is to say, it's to do with the surface of the Earth. And he went on to tell me a lot of rather interesting and weird things. Now, I better say right away that this man... Um, struck me as a bit of a weirdo. I mean, to begin with, he talked for two hours solid without stopping once. And every time I rang him subsequently, he talked for two hours. And sometimes he rang me when I was in the middle of my work, work and talked for another two hours. He really was an absolute non-stop talker. But it was pretty obvious that he wasn't a madman at all. I mean, he knew an enormous amount. His erudition was terrific. But he had some very strange ideas. I mean, to begin with, he was convinced that one of the satellites of Mars was actually put there by human beings and some other equally strange ideas. But the more I followed up on what he'd said about the geodetic evidence, the more I began to see that he got something very, very interesting to say. You see, um, a man called Berryman had pointed out, I think he was an English... Um, mathematician and geographer had pointed out around about 50 years ago one rather odd and interesting little fact. The Greeks seem to have known the exact size of the earth and their measure was called a stada, you know, it's the length of a stadium. And um, in fact, the length of the earth around the equator is precisely 216,000 stada. Now, that kind of precision doesn't happen by accident. It looks as if the Greeks knew the size of the Earth. But here's the interesting thing, they didn't. In fact, the size of the Earth was first worked out by a Greek around about a mere 200 BC called Eratosthenes. And he did it by a sort of interesting method. You all know the story that Eratosthenes heard that there is a certain will, a will at Syene on the upper Nile where the sun was reflected exactly at midday on Midsummer Day. <clears throat> and so, he, on Midsummer Day, measured the length of an obelisk in Cairo, because actually there was a shadow in Cairo. He knew that the distance between Syene and Cairo um, was precisely <clears throat> 500 miles, and was therefore able, by the angle and the length of the shadow 
knowing that the earth has a curve on it and that the sun which is coming down like that at Syene is coming down at an angle at Cairo, he knew that in point of fact the earth must be, he worked out, 24,000 miles around the equator. That's incredibly accurate because the actual measurement is just under 25,000 miles. Now, here's um, a fascinating piece of information. The ancient Egyptians also knew the precise size of the earth. And they knew it at the time they built the Great Pyramid, around about 2500 BC. We know that because one of the Egyptian priests told a man called Agatha Kaides, who was the tutor of the children of the Pharaoh, that the length of the Great Pyramid is exactly um, one-eighth of a degree um, of the circumference of the Earth. And in fact, the length of one side of the Great Pyramid is around about 475 feet. And <clears throat> if you multiply it out, you discover that in fact the ancient Egyptians knew the precise size of the Earth. And they got it right. They said it was more like 24,900 miles. The interesting thing is that also the height of the Great Pyramid is exactly like the height of the North Pole above the center of the Earth. In other words, the Great Pyramid is supposed to be, if you like, a triangular model of a hemisphere of the Earth. The Egyptians knew this, and people like Agatha Kaides were, were told this. Now, how on earth did the Egyptians know the size of the Earth at that time? It seems pretty obvious that they had some very complex knowledge. And this also appears in this matter that we're speaking about, about the circumference of the Earth. You see, the ancient Greeks themselves did not know the size of the Earth before Eratosthenes. But on the other hand, there had been far older traditions. And one of these older traditions comes down from ancient Babylon. In the middle of the 19th century, an Englishman called Henry Layard was digging in Mesopotamia, looking for the ruins of ancient Nineveh. And in point of fact, he struck gold. On this enormous library of Ashurbanipal under the earth. Now, what he discovered in the library of Ashurbanipal, uh, among a lot of other fascinating stuff, were certain clay tablets with enormous numbers on them, numbers running to 15 digits. Now, what on earth were the Assyrians, who were a particularly nasty and bloodthirsty lot, doing with this kind of knowledge? which you might possibly expect from, you know, a, a really highly evolved civilization like ancient India, but certainly not from the Assyrians. Well, the answer could well be this. The Assyrians are direct, directly descended from the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, in turn, were directed from the Sumerians. And the Sumerians were the people who had given us um, 60 minutes to an hour and, you know, all these other 60s. They counted basically in 60s. It is possible, therefore, that this knowledge of the ancient Greeks came down from the Sumerians, who were around about 5,000 BC. Now, when I was researching all this stuff and doing a trip down the Nile, the people in the next cabin said to me, have you ever seen this book? It's fascinating. They handed me a book by a man called Maurice Chatelain who had been the Frenchman who'd um, organized the electronics on the first moon flight. And I took this back to my cabin and read it. Chatelain had been enormously interested in these giant numbers that they discovered in Nineveh. And he thought, now supposing, in fact, those numbers came down from the Sumerians, and supposing they are in seconds, so he worked out what would happen if, in fact, this number was in seconds. And he quickly discovered that, in point of fact, it was around about 
six million years. Now, he got more and more interested in this enormous number because he quickly found that you could divide into it very precisely um, the number of years taken in something which is called the precession of the equinoxes. You know that the Earth's axis has a kind of wobble on it like that. Imagine a big pencil stuck through the Earth from top to bottom. Um, the top of the pencil, in a sense, ought to point towards the pole star due north. In point of fact, it goes around in a circle, wobbles like that, taking 26,000 years, or just under 26,000 years to do this. Now, the ancients knew all about this, and they thought this was very strange and very significant. They thought the gods were giving them a clue to the purpose of the universe. And so they studied precession of the equinoxes because this strange wobble makes the equinoxes appear to be going backwards, changing their time. Study the precession of the equinoxes very carefully. Now, when Chatelain tried dividing the precession of the equinoxes into this enormous Nineveh number, it divided absolutely precisely. So, in ancient Nineveh, they'd known all about precession of the equinoxes. Obviously, there must have been formidable mathematicians. But Chatelain discovered something that was equally fascinating. Um, in a place called Quiriga in South America, the Mayans had also left some stones with giant numbers on. The Maya came approximately 4,000 years later than the Sumerians. But when these numbers were compared once again, you could divide the precession of the equinoxes very, very precisely into these numbers. The ancient Mayans also knew these huge figures. Now, this fascinated Chatelain, who thought, was there some strange connection? But what connection could there be when there's a 4,000 years difference between the two? Then he thought, is it possible that this vast number, the Nineveh number, is in fact something that ancient astrologers and occultists used to call um, the universal constant? The universal constant was supposed to be an enormous number into which all the other numbers in the universe would divide precisely. That is to say, all the other, let's say, the, um, the orbits of the planets, um, the orbits of uh, the satellites and all of these other things were supposed to divide very precisely into this number. Well, Chatelain tried it and they all did with great exact precision. So he now knew he was onto something really big. His next um, question was why was in fact there a, a slight discrepancy in the sixth decimal place when he was reading about the orbit of the Earth. Now, you may think that a discrepancy in the sixth decimal place is nothing. But in fact, Chatelain had discovered that all this was so incredibly accurate that this really bothered him. Then he remembered a rather interesting fact. The Earth is very, very slowly slowing down. It's only something like one twelve millionth of a second per year. But he tried taking this into account, wondering, was there a time when this number was created when, in fact, you would have got an exact precise result in the sixth decimal place? Indeed, there was such a time, 65,000 years ago. So the conclusion Chatelain came to was that it was very likely that these enormous numbers had first been created 65,000 years ago before we were supposed to be on Earth. Now, by this time, of course, I was completely hooked. I was spending a great deal of time talking to um, my friend Carl on the telephone and paying for his phone calls that went on for two hours at a time. Now, when I put um, to my fellow author Rand all this stuff about Carl Rand would not have it he said the man's a fake he didn't know Hapgood and I said look whatever else Carl is he's not a fake he just knows too much <laughs>
he may be a bit of a nut, and he may sort of believe in all kinds of strange um, numerological theories, but he's not a fake. Anyway, um, what happened gradually was that um, Rand's uh, extremely skeptical attitude towards Carl got Carl, who was a bit thin-skinned and paranoid, more and more irritable, until finally he was writing me sort of extremely violent letters and blaming me for all this, and God knows I've paid about $8,000 to this bugger. <laughs> and um, anyway, that is why I'm not telling you his real name. <laughs> so, uh, what I wanted to know was what was all the significance of this, you know, for the rest of us? Let's say for a moment civilization really did exist a hundred thousand years ago, as Hapgood thought. Who was around a hundred thousand years ago? Well, the only person, the only human being around was um, our ancestor, or he wasn't even our ancestor, the Neanderthal man. But when we look very closely at Neanderthal man, we find that in fact he knew an enormous amount about the stars, and about all kinds of things. We also know that he was left-handed. We know that, in point of fact, he did have a kind of civilization, if by civilization you mean a fairly complex culture. There is enough evidence in ancient monuments that have been left by Neanderthal man. Now, for example, there's a cave in Switzerland which has a number of bear, carved bear heads, uh, bears, that is, which show beyond all doubt that he really knew all about the heavens. Now, the theory that was beginning to become more and more um, likely to me was that, in fact, this man we're looking for, this ancestor, was, in fact, Neanderthal man himself. And at this point, I must admit, my friend Ran began to scream and tear his hair, what little he's got, and uh, say, you know, you're going completely in the wrong direction. And um, I said, look, I've got to follow wherever this thing leads. And that, in point of fact, is um, what I continue to do. And that in, is the basic idea behind this book. But you see, as far as I'm concerned, there's far more to it than that. You see, what has always fascinated me in all my work has been the whole question of human evolution. How long have we been around? How did we come to evolve? How did we evolve into our present stage? That is what has always fascinated me. You see, my first book, The Outsider, which came out in 1956, was about romantics in the 19th century who committed suicide in droves or died in pointless accidents, um, all because when they'd been in these strange, happy moods that William James calls melting moods, they'd had this wonderful vision of the universe as an enormous unity and <clears throat> of everything as good. What G.K. Chesterton called absurd good news. Then, of course, they woke up the next morning to find that they were living you know, in a world that they found just too hard and too difficult for them. The result was that the sheer hardness of the physical world killed them off. Now, what I really wanted to know was this. Is that vision an illusion? Or is there some way, in fact, in which that vision could be realized? This is what interested me so much. Now, the outsider was simply about the question of the, of the actual meaning of the vision that the outsiders had seen and whether there is any way of realizing that in this world. W.B. Yeats had written in one of his poems, what the world's million lips are searching for must be substantial somewhere. That feeling that, you know, it exists. We ought to be able to go out and find it. And it was the feeling that it is meaningful to talk about this sort of 
ultimate vision that had led me to write my books after The Outsider. Now, in 1958, I received a letter from an American professor of psychology called Abraham Maslow. And Maslow wrote that he'd read a book of mine called The Age of Defeat, in which I said that modern literature is full of defeatism. That the <clears throat> basic feeling of the modern writer seems to be, you can't win. Now Maslow himself said that he felt that modern psychology sells human nature short. And what he said was this. He said that as a psychologist, and he was the head of the American Psychological Association, he got sick of studying sick people because they talked about nothing but their sickness. So he decided that he would study healthy people instead. So he asked around among his friends, who's the healthiest person you know? And they, various friends would put him onto healthy people. And he began studying healthy people instead of sick people. And he quickly discovered something that nobody had ever discovered before because nobody had ever thought of studying healthy people. And that was that all extremely healthy people appeared to have with a fair degree of frequency what Maslow called peak experiences, just experiences of sudden bubbling, overwhelming, tremendous happiness. And these weren't mystical visions at all. He said this was a perfectly normal capability of the average human being. He said, for example, a young housewife was sitting watching her husband and kids eating breakfast when a beam of sunlight came in through the window and she suddenly thought, my God, aren't I lucky? and went into the peak experience. A marine who'd been in the Pacific for years and years without ever seeing a woman went back to base and saw a nurse and went into the peak experience because he said he suddenly realized women are different from men. <laughs> he said, we don't realize that. We don't see that this is true, but they're as different from men as horses are from cows. And Again, a student who was working his way through college as a jazz drummer suddenly found about two o'clock one morning he just could not do a thing wrong. He drummed absolutely superbly and perfectly and went into the peak experience. Well, Maslow collected all these peak experiences and got his students to tell, them, tell him about the peak experiences they'd had. They'd more or less forgotten about it at the time that you kind of swallow it, you know, like swallowing a sweet and forget all about it. But now they began talking to one another about their peak experiences, a very interesting thing happened. They began having peak experiences all the time. Merely reminding one another of peak experiences was enough to send them off into the peak experience. Why? Because the essence of a peak experience is that kind of wonderful feeling of freedom You see, I'd, my greatest peak experience ever, I suppose, was once um, when I was in Cheltenham with my wife and our little daughter, Sally, who was then three years old. And uh, <clears throat> Joyce stayed behind tidying up the boot of the car to make room for the second-hand books we were going to buy, and Sally came into the shop with me. And after a bit, Sally got bored and said, where's Mummy? So I took her to the door of the shop and said, look, there she is. And so she trotted off and you know it's about as far as Cody is from me at this moment and um, ten minutes later Joy came into the shop and she, Sally wasn't with her but I assumed she was in the car and then I said casually where's Sally and Joy said I don't know I thought she was with you and of course instant panic we'd never been separated from her since she was born and <laughs> she suddenly disappeared well we rushed outside and the street was crowded with traffic in both directions and uh, no sign of Sally I rushed one way down to the corner and there were barriers at the corner and traffic lights, so she couldn't have gone that way. I rushed back and there was Joy, and I said, have you seen her? And Joy said, no, and so off we went again in opera. God, I was frenzied. I'd suddenly got this feeling, you know, your daughter has disappeared and you're never going to see her again. Some nut has gone off with her and that's your lot. And um, anyway, the next time I went back, Joy had found her. She'd wandered right around the block to the other side, but, you know, she was still there. Anyway, we took Sally into the shop and we purchased the books and we got back in the car. And as we drove off, I suddenly realized that I was in an extraordinary state. Um, I was thinking, my God, aren't buses beautiful objects? <laughs>
And, <laughs> and um, isn't exhaust smoke a lovely smell? <laughs> and I was in this condition of complete wide openness. And we were stuck in a queue of traffic that just stuck for miles along some roadworks. And I just sat there in perfect ecstatic happiness, looking at the drizzle falling on the road and the windscreen wipers, and feeling just completely, deeply happy and relaxed. And thinking, my God, isn't this a wonderful universe? And seeing, of course, what you realize in these states, that it's a wonderful universe all the time, but you don't see it. Why? Because you are focused upon little things. We are focused upon tiny things that give us a kind of worm's eye view of reality. Whereas what happened when we found Sally was that I suddenly got a kind of bird's eye view of reality. And we human beings do not have very much capacity for generating a bird's eye view of reality. Why? Because we don't really see any point. You know, you, you get along okay in your everyday life, you move from thing to thing and do the next thing that's to be done. And it's only in these occasional moments which of course are the moments the outsiders talked of as these moments of revelation, of absurd good news and so on, that we suddenly realize that life could be completely different. Now, as I say, Maslow's students were simply people who having reminded one another as they talked about the peak experience, the peak experiences are possible, they suddenly began having bird's eye views all the time as a perfectly normal capability of their humanity. And it suddenly struck me that I'd hit upon something of terrific importance and had also accidentally hit upon the answer to the problem that I'd written about in The Outsider. The answer to these people. The trouble with these 19th century people was they were getting these bird's eye views that were real all right. Then they woke up the next morning and found themselves back in the worm's eye view. And they said, my God, was the bird's eye view an illusion? And for the most part, they answered, yes. You know, Shelley says in the hymn to intellectual beauty, why dost thou go away and leave our state, this dim, vast veil of tears, vacant and desolate? There's that feeling that it goes away and there's nothing you can do about it. You're finished. Now, it suddenly struck me that what I'd done was to hit upon a practical down-to-earth proof, so to speak, that the vision of the outsiders and the mystic was true. And as soon as Maslow's students realized that it was true, it changed them completely. And so, I began a kind of quest which has continued over the years for ways in which to get out of our worm's eye view and back into the bird's eye view. And I discovered some quite interesting ones. Um, one of them, which I've quoted again and again, and which, you know, anybody who's ever read me is going to groan as I quote yet again, um, was Graham Greene and his Russian roulette. You remember Graham Greene? said that um, when he was at school, he got into a state of utter misery and boredom, so that finally he was so bored that everything he looked at looked gray and dull. He could see that something was beautiful visually, but he felt nothing whatsoever. He said, and at this time when he was feeling so miserable and despairing, he found in a cupboard a revolver belonging to his elder brother, and he took it out onto Berkhamsted Common and played Russian roulette. He put one bullet in the chambers, spun the chambers, pointed it at his head and pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he said he looked down the barrel and saw the bullet had now come into position. He said and he felt a terrific, overwhelming feeling of pure happiness. He said it, it was as if a light had been turned on and I suddenly saw that the whole universe is wonderful. Now, if you turn on a light, what you see is what was there before the light was turned on. And yet the weird thing is that Green, although he went on playing Russian roulette another five times, and unfortunately didn't blow out his brains because I think he's the worst bloody novelist of the 20th century. <laughs> um, nevertheless, Green slipped straight back into the state of boredom that he'd always been in. Now, this was for me the great question. Is there in fact some way of achieving that sort of state of bird's eye consciousness without risking blowing your brains out. There must be simpler ways of doing it than that. And in fact, I gradually began to discover that in fact there are ways of doing it more simpler than that. And, and, and I've got time, so I'll go on with this a couple of minutes. In fact, 
I was talking to um, a pupil of Wilhelm Reich, a woman who'd been with him several years, and she said to me, have you ever tried Reichian breathing? So I said, no, what's that? And she said, well, look, lie down on the floor. So I lay down on the floor. She said, now, breathe in very deeply into your chest. She said, and then when you breathe out, say, out, down, through. She said, out through your chest, down through your solar plexus, and then through your genitals, and then push the energy down to your feet. And I tried this, and in fact, you know, I tried it again and again on classes and found that it worked beautifully. You really do get a wonderful feeling as if you sucked in some vital energy, right call it orgone energy, from the, from the air itself, and you're charging up your body. Now, it also struck me, though, that when Graham Greene was doing this thing with his Russian roulette, what he was doing, in point of fact, was, think of it, he's in a state of boredom and misery, sort of, uh, he takes the gun and puts it to his head, and he pulls the trigger, and his whole being goes, Argh! and then there's just a click, and he goes, oh, and immediately goes into the peak experience. The basic trick is, Argh! And so I began doing that. I called it the pencil trick. And what I did in point of fact was to take a pencil. You just hold a pencil up against anything like a white wall. And you concentrate on it until you can concentrate no harder, until it actually begins to hurt you behind the eyes. And then you relax. And then you concentrate once again. And then you relax once again. Now you'll find that when you've done that round about 10 or 12 times, it hurts so much that you can't go on. You're tired. <laughs> When that happens, go on, because you'll find that you suddenly go into the peak experience. Now, one day in Finland, I was telling my class about the pencil trick, and I got them all to do the pencil trick. And then I told them about Reiki and breathing. And then I said, come on, let's combine these two. They sound completely uncombinable, because one of them depends upon tension, and the other depends on relaxation. But let's try it. And so that's what we did. We lay there on the floor, our pencils held against the ceiling, and I said, OK, now breathe in deeply. And as you do that, concentrate like mad. Then breathe out, down, through. And as you do that, let go this tension. Well, half an hour later, I looked at my watch and said, my god, it's time for lunch. Come on. And we'd just been lying there on the floor, all of us in a kind of floating condition of complete ecstatic happiness. So I discovered one rather interesting trick for doing this. Now, you see, you say, what has all this got to do with the business of ancient man? I very quickly realized that ancient man knew certain things that we don't know. For example, if you go to Egypt, when um, you're looking at the Sphinx, have a look at the Sphinx temple, which stands more or less to the right of the Sphinx. The Sphinx temple is made of blocks that weigh 200 tons each. And we would have no idea of how to get them in place except with terrific lifting cranes, which the Egyptians did not have. There's another place called the Osirian, which is at Abydos. And again, you've got these giant blocks. They're quite different from the blocks they used in the temples and almost certainly they're far, far older. They knew how to raise these enormous sized blocks. And it's quite obvious when you read Schwaller on ancient Egypt that they knew an enormous number of other things too. We still have no idea of how to go about building something like the Great Pyramid. We just don't know how, how it was done. You know, put these enormous blocks weighing six tons each on course after course after course. What did they do? Use an enormous ramp? Use a kind of gigantic ladder? We have no idea. As we keep on discovering these extraordinary um, technical achievements, we realize that the ancients knew something we do not know. Now, almost certainly, one of the things they understood very well was a peculiar method of relaxation which enables you to literally leave your body.
And I suddenly began to see something about this. When I was reading a book, uh, now stupidly, I forgot to look up the title of the book before I came in here. But um, it was a book by a um, computer scientist called um, a name like Kevin Smith. He was describing a meeting held in California in which the whole audience had taken part in experiments um, which involved the audience needing to respond exactly and precisely to what was going on on a giant screen on stage. Um, they had to hold up a number of wands which were colored red on one side and green on the other according to the sort of ping pong ball on the screen. And soon the whole audience was doing this absolutely perfectly. The whole audience had begun to do this. They'd begun somehow to synchronize perfectly with one another. The next thing they did was to get everybody in the audience to watch a computer simulation of one of those things that pilots use to train, to bring an airplane into land. And the whole audience together, using their wands, had to bring the plane into land. And soon the whole audience had got the plane coming down perfectly. And on one occasion, it was quite obvious that it wasn't, <laughs> they weren't making a good touchdown. The whole audience made the plane take off again and go up into the air, and the whole audience was so delighted, they made the plane loop the loop. <laughs> that all of them got into such total close contact that somehow they'd become one single person. Now, this, I am absolutely convinced, is what the ancient Egyptians were able to do. In some way, they weren't divided in the way that we are, in the way that we've become divided since we've separated the left and the right brain. They were somehow completely unified as creatures. But the interesting thing is that that experiment with the, um, the plane shows that we could do it too if we wanted. Now, this is something I would like to bet you. If we, this audience, now got so interested in this that we began to actually do this as a kind of experiment, I'm pretty sure that in a very short time we would also devise ways in which we could shift 200 ton blocks. Have you ever done this uh, thing in which four of you lift a heavy person with your fingers? <laughs> well, you know it can be done. But what you do, first of all, of course, is you place your hands all on top of one another in a kind of volta pile, concentrate very hard, then you pull your hands away, and the person sitting in the chair, you stick your fingers under his armpits and two more fingers under his knees, and then you lift him. They zoom up off the ground, and yet he weighs as much as he did before. Somehow, our minds are able to do these peculiar things. And it struck me that this is what we're talking about, some odd power that the ancients possessed and that we have now more or less forgotten because we're so stuck in our left brain that we no longer have these peculiar moments of bird's eye consciousness. Now, fairly recently I came across the most interesting psychologist that I've discovered since Maslow. His name is George Pransky. And um, he operates somewhere around the um, New York area. George Pransky believes that the basic problem with human beings is that we don't realize the extraordinary power of our thoughts to change our moods and everything else about us. And he learned all this when he heard about an ordinary man, not a psychologist, an ordinary man called Sidney Banks, who was giving lectures on psychology to large groups of professional people. And he was a psychologist himself, Pransky, so he went along to hear Banks lecture. And it was quite obvious that Banks had had some kind of revelation that he was able to communicate to all these other people. Pransky said the first thing that struck him about this audience was that they all seemed to be so incredibly sort of cheerful and healthy. Obviously, somehow, Banks had got across them in a peculiar way. Now, the way that all this had happened, Pransky told me, was this. Banks 
had remarked to a friend of his, oh God, I feel so unhappy. And the friend said, you're not unhappy, Sid, you just think you are. And he said, what did you say? And when the friend repeated it, he said, my God, do you realize what you've just said? And he went on to realize that this is the problem with human beings. We don't realize this extraordinary power of thought. Buckminster Fuller said once, I appear to be a verb. And it's this recognition that you yourself are in fact a verb. You see, when you're in an ordinary state of consciousness, you're a noun, you're passive. And then you suddenly get into these peculiar states, such as I got into when we found Sally in Cheltenham, when you turn into a verb. And this is what happened to Sid Banks. He suddenly realized that we're verbs who think we're nouns. And that as soon as you can grasp how powerful your own thought is in changing you from one to the other, you know, there's the uh, old joke of some man going next door to borrow the lawnmower from a friend, and <clears throat> he can see this friend is going to say, now look, why don't you get yourself a lawnmower instead of borrowing mine? And he's going to say, well, you know, it's not really worth it, I, and so on and so forth. And finally he knocks on the door, and the friend open, opens the door, and he says, keep your bloody lawnmower, <laughs> and turns and walks away. Now, we're always doing that. We're always letting our moods and emotions get us into states. And these states influences completely because we really believe that that is, so to speak, what is true at the moment. And what Banks had discovered was that as soon as you recognize this is not so, what happens is exactly what happened with Maslow's students who realized that as soon as they began to talk to one another about peak experiences, they began having peak experiences all the time. They changed into verbs instead of nouns. Now, you can see that what, what I, I appear to be saying is basically ancient people had not loaded themselves up with our enormous amount of left brain knowledge. Moreover, they also believed that they were creatures of the gods. You know, in ancient Egypt, in a certain sense, you felt that you were in an ideal kind of condition. When you died, um, you would be sort of carried off to the stars with the gods and it was all tremendously simple and straightforward the result was that ancient Egyptian civilization was probably as close as human beings ever came to a golden age and this really happened round about the time of Cheops now I think that civilization is indeed far far older than we believe I think that in point of fact, Hapgood was right. Civilization probably is way over 100,000 years old. You see, we keep discovering all kinds of strange and interesting things about man. Um, recently, there was discovery on the island of Flores, which is somewhere near Java. They found all kinds of Stone Age tools. But these Stone Age tools, which were fairly complex, belong to our remote ancestor, Homo erectus. But what is also more interesting is that we know that this island of Flores has been an island for the past million years, and yet Homo erectus, our remote ancestor, had managed to get onto this island by building rafts. Now, my belief is you cannot build a raft unless you have a fairly complex communication system. In other words, unless you can talk language. I think there is every evidence that human beings were extremely intelligent a million years ago. And I also think that if you've got somebody as intelligent as a human being, then certainly he's going to build an extremely complex civilization which is going to tend to disappear periodically, wiped out completely like wiping chalk off a blackboard. This is what Hapgood came to believe. Hapgood, in that book, maps of the ancient sea kings, was convinced that what had happened is that there was once a giant ocean-going civilization that covered the whole earth and he's introduced some extremely interesting evidence from all over the globe, from China, from Russia, showing that they all appear to have showed the same signs of a high level of civilization. And he thinks, he says in his book, dating back 
7000 BC. Now, of course, what Hapgood did not dare to breathe was the word Atlantis, because it would simply have been more than his job was worth. But nevertheless, that is what he believed. And on, one of the, on the Piri Rice map, right opposite the mouth of the Orinoco, there is a large island which Hapgood was convinced was Atlantis. And he thought that, in fact, Atlantis was... Is, all that's there now is a couple of rocks called the Peter and Paul Rocks. He, think, he thought that Atlantis was below the surface, and he actually, first of all, tried to get President Kennedy to back him on this, and got an interview with President Kennedy, and unfortunately, President Kennedy was shot two days before Hapgood got to see him. Um, he got to Walt Disney and suggested that this would make a marvellous film, this search for Atlantis, because he was convinced that if you could go below the Peter and Paul Rocks, you would find mountain slopes, and you basically find evidence of civilization. Now, none of this came off. And so Hapgood, in a way, was a pretty disappointed man. He had done some of the most interesting work of that period, and yet, in many ways, he remained completely unknown. Now, when Hapgood retired, he also got extremely interested in hypnosis because a hypnotist had come along to Keene State College where he was working and had actually shown hypnotic regression with um, various students. And Hapgood himself got good at this hypnotic regression and he regressed a student called Henry and got Henry to say all kinds of interesting things about the things he'd done a couple of months ago. He then said, look, Henry, I'm going to take you into next week, next Wednesday. What are you going to do next Wednesday? Henry said, you know, I've had a most interesting day. I've been out at the airport all day, and I heard some very interesting stuff about that plane crash that happened six months ago. He said, and then in the evening, he said, I went down to um, a sort of little place downtown where I drank some beer. He said, and I got to know a couple of loose ladies. He said, who made some very lewd suggestions. <laughs> And so he went on. So anyway, a week later, Hapgood got hold of him and said, um, Hey, Henry, um, where did you go yesterday? And Henry said that he'd been out to the airport and that he'd heard some very interesting stuff. And Hapgood said, Look, let me tell you the rest. He said, Now, you went downtown, didn't you? You found this little beer place and you got talking to some ladies who tried to make lewd suggestions. And Henry said, Oh, my God, I didn't tell you what they said, did I? And Hapgood said, No, you didn't, Henry. Henry said, oh, thank God for that. <laughs> anyway, what Hapgood had shown was that you can hypnotize people to see the future. Now, when I wanted to put that into my book, Rand said, oh, no, no, no. We don't want that kind of thing in our book, which is supposed to be scientific. And so I left it out. I left out a hell of a lot of stuff. I left out all this fascinating stuff of this weirdo called Hergesheimer, because Rand didn't want it in there. But at least, you know, he's left me the material for another book, which I intend to write now. But briefly, what fascinates me most of all is this discovery of Sid Banks. And in point of fact, we are really verbs. And that this, in a sense, is the answer to the problem which has been bothering me all my life. Once you can actually begin to see that it is your own moods which impose upon you and give you the feeling of who you are and where you are and what you're doing, you can gradually learn to, as it were, sidestep them and recognize that, you know, you can sidestep them because the thing inside your head is alive. It has choice. It has freedom. This is why Maslow's student has peak experiences all the time, because they'd suddenly recognize their own basic freedom. And as soon as you do that, you suddenly realize that you've taken a step that in point of fact is the next most important step in human evolution. But you also realize another interesting thing. Our ancestors were already closer to it than we are nowadays. We've loaded ourselves down with so much extraneous material with this enormous commercialized civilization that it's far more difficult for us than it would have been for them. Anyway, that's all. <laughs>